well, I suppose that it was going to be inevitable that I would be talking about magnetism and flat Earth. And today I want to address the flat Earth claim that the Earth core cannot possibly be magnetic. Um, but to begin, I will start with some basics in magnetism. Now we start with Maxwell's equations, mainly the ones dealing with electrostatics and magnetostatics. On the left we have Gauss's law for magnetism, which tells us that there's no such thing as an isolated charge, or magnetic monopoles are not possible, and this means that whenever we have a magnet, it must have a north pole and a south pole. Now on the right we have Ampere's law, which describes how a moving electric charge creates a magnetic field which curls in loops around the path of the electric current. Now there is also a neat addition by Maxwell, which is not actually shown here, but it tells us that a change in the electric field produces a change in the magnetic field and vice versa, and this actually describes light. Of course, this is just all funny maths. So let's move to some pictures. And this is actually what Ampere's law describes. We have a current flowing down a wire and this creates a magnetic field which curls around the wire. But what if we extend this and have the current flow in a loop? And this is the result we would get. We have a yellow current loop that creates magnetic field lines which take a toroidal shape. In the center of the loop, the magnetic field points up as indicated by the arrow. But let's tidy this up by only showing this on a 2D slice so we can clearly see the field lines. This is basically the principle by which electromagnets work, but there's also something more fundamental which works like this, and this is atoms. In the classical Rutherford model of the atom, we have electrons orbiting the atom, and an electron is a particle with electric charge, so an electron orbiting can be considered a current loop, and then it creates a magnetic field like this one. However, the much more improved Bohr model of the atom says that this is wrong, uh, but it has a different explanation, because the key point is, is that this magnetic field is what we observe. And the black arrow points in the direction of the magnetic field in the center of this current loop, and this indicates a vector called the magnetic moment, or colloquially referred to as spin. But let's take a look at magnetism on a very small scale, because when talking about magnetism, we inevitably bump into four energies, and these are the Zeeman energy, the exchange energy, magnetostatic energy, and the magnetocrystalline energy. I won't cover the last one, as it will require a couple of years of condensed matter physics training to really get to grips with. Now, the Zeeman energy is most intuitive. It is the energy associated with the orientation of a spin in a magnetic magnetic field. And this is the energy term that you take advantage of when using a compass. When the spin or compass needle is aligned with the field, the Zeeman energy is at a minimum. The Zeeman energy increases with angle until the spin is anti-aligned with the field, at which point the energy is the highest. Now the next energy term is exchange energy. And this energy term is unique to ferromagnetism and anti-ferromagnetic materials, and we'll only treat ferromagnetics in this video. But the exchange energy is the energy associated with a quantum mechanical interaction between adjacent spins. The lowest energy state is when the nearest neighbor spins are aligned, and the highest energy state is when they're anti-aligned. And this is important to remember for the next bit. Magnetostatic energy is associated with the magnetic field that a spin produces. The lowest exchange energy state is one where all spins in a material are aligned, but there comes a problem. When all these spins are aligned, the magnetic field due to each spin adds up, and this causes a large stray field, which has high magnetostatic energy associated with it and all the spins could orientate themselves randomly to minimize the stray field, but this would come at a cost of increased exchange energy. Instead, what we see is groups of spin creating entire regions where all spins are aligned, and then there are small boundaries between these regions, and these regions are called magnetic domains, and the boundaries are called domain walls. In the middle, we have a situation where we have one domain which points up and one domain which points down, and the stray field changes, and it becomes much smaller, and thus reducing the magnetostatic energy. We take this a step further by adding more domains, and this time there are domains pointing left and right as well, and what we see here is that there's no stray magnetic field, and the magnetostatic energy is at a minimum. Actually, 
when we consider all the energy terms, this is the lowest energy state and the material does not produce a magnetic field. However, this can change. Now, from experience, we know that if we take a ferromagnetic object such as kitchen scissors and rub it with a magnet, the scissors become magnetic even after we take the magnet away. So what happens here? Now first we start with our material in the ground state where the domains are arranged to minimize magnetostatic energy. But then we apply a magnetic field and at this point the Zeeman energy becomes the dominant term and you can see that the blue is in a low energy state as it is aligned with the field but the green and purple regions are in a high energy state and the red regions is even higher. To minimize the energy the spins try to align with the magnetic field and this results in domain walls moving so the blue region grows at the cost of the other regions until the domain walls reach the edge and they disappear. The object is now in a saturated state where all spins point in one direction. But when we remove the field, it stays this way, even though it is in a higher energy state compared to the ground state. And this is because however high this energy state is, the intermediate state still has a higher energy. In a saturated state, we only have the magnetostatic energy, and in the ground state, we only really have exchange energy. But the intermediate state has both. It has roughly the same amount of exchange energy as the ground state, and nearly as much magnetostatic energy as the saturated state. And this presents an energy barrier that must be overcome before the system can go back to the ground state. In many cases, you could just tap the material and that should provide enough energy to overcome this barrier. In some cases though, this energy barrier is so large that it never returns to the ground state, and this is called a permanent magnet. However, there is one way that you can provide enough energy, and this is by heating it up. You see, the energy difference between the saturated state and the intermediate state has a temperature associated with it and this is called the Curie temperature. Now, if you heat up a magnet sufficiently and then let it cool, the result will be a non-magnetic lump of metal. And this is the argument that flat earthers use to claim that the Earth's core cannot possibly create a magnetic field. After all, the core is made up of molten iron which flows about the axis and it is well above the Curie temperature. But, as expected, flat earthers forget about some key ideas. I have already mentioned them, so if you want, you could pause the video to think about it for a bit and figure out why their claim is completely irrelevant. Okay, so the core is made of molten iron, which flows about the axis. Iron contains lots of free electrons or charged particles, which are moving in circles around the Earth's axis, and this creates a current loop. It is worth pointing out that this model hasn't quite got the state of proper scientific theory yet. There are competing ideas, but numerical models are being developed and the evidence is quickly building to confirm this dynamo theory. And that just leaves me to say thank you to all my patrons, MC Toon, Dr. Thomas Miller, Stringer News One, and Kevin Dedman. And thank you for watching. And if you've enjoyed this, then, well, you know what buttons to press and tickle. So until next time.